Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at PDF Solutions with Mark Jacobs. We're going to talk today about cost and quality of chiplets. Mark, as we get into the world of chiplets, this is very complex integration, assembly, all sorts of issues that we really haven't dealt with altogether in the past. What sort of problems are you seeing? We're seeing a number of problems, especially in test. First, how much test is enough? Second, how do you optimize system binning, the right speed and power of your final product? And third, what's the right amount of burn-in or system level test that your chiplet-based product will need? Let's take a closer look. Sure. What factors do you have to consider when you're thinking about tests? Because these devices are becoming much more complicated and they're also going into areas that are system and mission critical. Yes. So we see a need to use machine learning algorithms to help people optimize for the right amount of test. Sometimes to test more, sometimes to test less. How do you get there? We think the way that's best suited for this is to do adaptive test. Not only can you decide how much test to do on this lot, but also this wafer or this unit. Doing the adaptive test will tailor the test to the specific unit that's being tested at that moment. What is adaptive test and how does it differ from other kinds of tests? So in adaptive test, you can use machine learning to do real-time or almost real-time inferences, decisions on the need of each unit for testing. You can test more on units that need it or test less on units that don't. And this is all tied into cost trade-offs, right? Cost and quality trade-offs. The idea is to put the extra test where it's necessary and not like it has been traditionally to do more tests on every unit. Most of the units may not need that, but the ones that do, you don't want to have them go to your customer and fail. Really what you're thinking about here is going granular with things that you used to do just broad brush strokes, right? That is correct. Doing granular is particularly difficult. How long has adaptive test been around? Adaptive test in the way that we're describing has been around under 10 years, and people have been working on it pretty intensely during that time. But with chiplets, it takes on a whole new meaning, right? In chiplets, it's much more important because the cost and complexity of the product has escalated. One bad chiplet will wreck the entire final product. When we look at chips, a lot of those were binned on the basis of how well did it perform. If it wasn't quite up to snuff, it still had a use in some applications. Yes. What happens with chiplets? How does that change? So with chiplets, and this is what we mean by system binning, the problem is that you have multiple chiplets, multiple die, into one finished product. If before you had a low power, low speed product, or a high power, high speed product, that would be fine. But now if you have, say, four chiplets in one finished product, you could have three that are high speed and relatively high power, one that's low speed and low power. The combination is a high power, low speed device. Either no one wants it, in which case it's not saleable at all, or somebody will want it at fire sale prices. And you could have dozens of chiplets in a, a single device, right? Yes. We've seen numbers of chiplets from 2 to 50. And that variation in performance is additive too, right? So if you have one chiplet that's, that's bad and it's 5% less and you have another one that's 5% less, you don't go 5%, it's now 10% for the whole thing. It can be. It can also make it non-functional. What happens in terms of burn-in? That's been another uh, key part of this whole equation here, right? Right. So people are doing burn-in in production to prevent infant mortality failures. They're also doing system level test, running the chip in mission mode during their production flow. Both of these are designed to remove quality and early reliability failures. The problem with this as chiplets is now you're combining multiple die and 
needing to make decisions on how much burn-in or SLT you need for the multiple die. So given all of these factors, where do you go next? I mean, what do you have to do now that you didn't do in the past? So what we see a necessity for is the volume of data is increasing. The decisions are harder to make. The decisions become beyond human scale to figure out. And that's why we see machine learning as a solution for this problem. You're really digging for deep patterns that you would not normally find, right? That is correct. Often you'll find the answer is something that everybody would say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, that would be the right thing. But you might have a product with 500,000 test items. Figuring out which of the 500,000 test items is critical is beyond people working by hand. There's another factor which comes into this too, which is that when you're thinking about chiplets, these are very customized solutions. Each one, the whole idea behind chiplets is you're going to customize as you go forward. What does that do for tests and the patterns that you're developing? Is the data the same from one to the next? So depending on how the chiplet is designed, some of the chiplets are designed so that a core is swapped out and some peripheral items are reused product after product. Other ones are a core that's reused and the periphery changes, some everything changes. It varies by customer um, how they want to solve that problem. Mark, what are we looking at? We're looking at a flow diagram simplified for a chiplet-based product. Starting here and the wafer sort for chiplet A and chiplet B. We have this for a two chiplet solution to make the drawing simple. If you had a four chip or a 50 chip, it just goes vertically down the page. You do wafer sort, you put them into packaging. After packaging, there's a single device now. You do final test, system level test, and shipment. And this is a lot more complicated in the real world, right? Because you're dealing with uh, all sorts of issues in terms of, can I even get to test these, these, uh, some of these devices the way we used to test them? It's more complicated, and I've made this simple for the drawing, but this box here that says wafer sort one might be a two insert flow with room and hot. Final test might be multi-temperature as well. There might be different equipment <laughs> For some of these steps at final test because chiplet one might be a digital SOC and chiplet two might be an RF product. All of this is simplified so we can talk about it um, today. Where does adaptive test fit into all this? So this is the flow if you didn't do adaptive test. But say you wanted to do adaptive test at final test. You would make a machine learning model that took upstream data and send it from, for example, wafer sort to final test. That we call data feed forward. You're sending the data from wafer sort to final test, but you're not sending all of the data from all the wafers. You're sending the right data from this die that's at final test test now, you're having the data from wafer sort. Not only that, but you might want to take the data from final test and use it to make decisions at final test itself. That's a particularly stressful and difficult task. Do the insertion points change at all? The insertion points don't change. The test inserts are still the same test inserts but you're using the data to change the test, sometimes in real time, sometimes while the unit is in the socket. And is all the data necessarily there that you expect? The data doesn't get there by itself. Getting the data to the tester at the right moment is a particularly difficult task. We call that model ops. This wafer sort may be in one factory, final test may be in another factory. They may be in different companies. They may be in different countries. 
you need to get the data from where it was generated to where it's needed. And just to be clear, adaptive test is not necessarily an adaptive test machine, right? It's a different way of doing it. It is a different way of doing it. However, to do the last most complicated step, you do need often extra hardware. You need to be able to make inferences, machine learning decisions in real time on the ATE at final test. Do you need different expertise for this? You need a combination of two different kinds of expertise. The people making the models that are coming up with these decisions, that are coming up with these inferences, those are often data scientists, people who have expertise in machine learning. The people who are actually making the adaptive test happen are test engineers. You need both to be successful. And also, are you using your traditional tools like fi for final test and SLT, are they are you using them the same amount and doing more with them, or are you actually using them less in certain cases? So we see both kind of applications. We see people doing test more on units that need it and test less where they don't. And that's the adaptive part. If you just blindly did test less on everything, then if you had a particularly troublesome lot, you would ship it, it would go to the customer, it would fail. It would be bad. You'd be on the apology tour the next day. So what it comes down to is you're really just, imp you're taking your coverage and saying, this is where we need it most and we're improving the coverage where you need it. Exactly right. Mark Jacobs, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.